How's everybody doing? Good, 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 good. All right. Uh, like, as Jeff said, we're going to talk about caching today. Uh, I have to do the uh, the obligatory ask. Uh, how many of us in the room have used caching plugin before? Okay, so about half. Um, how many in the room are pretty new to caching? So you're here to learn. You want to know more about the about half. Fantastic. Cool. All right. Well, we'll tailor today towards kind of both groups. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Frankie Jarrett, and uh, I am a, a WordPress guy. So I've been working with WordPress for um, a little over a decade. I'm the engineering manager at GoDaddy, and I oversee our managed WordPress hosting products. And uh, I, I work uh, remotely. So I work in St. Joseph, Missouri, which is just north of here. Uh, it's my hometown. And uh, I've been working remotely for seven years, going on eight. And uh, it's, it's great. I get to stay home with my family and watch the kids grow up and, and do tech. So it's a different world we live in, but it's very uh, rewarding. So that's a little bit about me. And uh, let's just ask the question, why should we care about how fast our websites are? Uh, these are some ones that I came up with. Does anybody else have any, have any ideas? High user engagement, that's probably important, right? Yeah. Anybody else have any that you can think of? <coughs> Do what? Mobile world. Mobile world. That's a really good one. Analytics. Conversion rates. Conversion rates. Yep. So, yep. Time is money. Yep. Bandwidth cost. That's probably not a really big one anymore, but I mean, it does cost money. <laughs> User frustration. Yep. And then I just kind of said because Google cares. Because it's like, well, if Google cares, maybe I should care. Um, okay, cool. So we kind of all are in this room because we already know that our website should be fast, but I think it's just important that we kind of maybe think about the reasons why before we get into this. So let's just talk about what caching is because I think sometimes we can uh, make it a little bit more of a mystery than it needs to be. It doesn't have to be that hard, but we kind of think, uh, well, I'll just install this plugin or I'll go to this site and I'll type in my URL and I'll hit this button and it's going to tell me if I'm fast or not or what I need to do. Um, but it really doesn't get down to the root of what caching is, what the different layers are. Um, you, keep, you know, there are certain layers of caching. If you turn them both on, they actually work against each other. So it's important to know uh, what the different types of caching are. And so let's just get down to the real root of the definition. What is caching? It's a temporary copy of data that can be served faster than the original. So it's always a copy. Uh, it's never making your actual site faster, if that, if that makes sense. It also has to make it faster. If caching makes it slower, then it's not caching. It's just bad. Um, so so these, these are the things that must be true in order for something to be caching. We're making a temporary copy of something, probably because we can now serve it faster through a different medium. We can serve it faster if it exists in a different form than if we have to go crunch the numbers you know, from the source. So that's really what caching is at the heart of it. And today we're going to go through some very popular layers of caching that you would experience in the WordPress world. So these are common ones you'll hear about. You would uh, go to a caching plugin website or something and you would go tell me about what this thing does and they would enumerate these things. But it might just all sound like weird techno talk. Uh, so today we're going to kind of get drilled down into what those eight layers are so everyone can walk away from today. That's, that's the goal. Let's walk away from this room having learned more about what caching layers are. And then uh, we're going to have a lot of time at the end for, for questions. So uh, if you have questions, uh, write them down, save them. We're going we're gonna to talk about it. So caching layers. Yeah, it is kind of complicated. Uh, it can get a little bit tricky, especially as I said before with layers working against other layers. And so that's why it's really important that uh, we test. We don't just turn stuff on and walk away. We turn stuff on and we, we want to measure and understand the impact uh, in, which, in, in which our caching optimizations uh, are really having. Okay, so first layer I want to talk about is a thing called transient cache. So don't be too afraid about the right hand side of the screen if you don't if you're not a code person. I just put that up there as an example for those of us in the room that are code people. Okay, so transient cache is, the, the basic concept is it's a key value store. So a key being the reference point, the value being this is the value uh, for that key. And it's storage of that data, and then it is going to check for changes on a regular basis, and it's going to uh, store things that may be expensive to fetch. So kind of an, an example here is if we want to check things on a regular uh, interval, let's say uh, you know, we want to check 
uh, theme, or sorry, plugin updates. That's my example here uh, on the right. So we will, WordPress will go ask WordPress servers, hey, are updates available for these plugins? But it doesn't want to do that every time you load WordPress. It just wants to do that every now and then. So there's an expiration on that value. It goes and fetches whether or not there's updates, stores that in the database as a transient cache, and then knows I don't ask for that again until X number of minutes or X number of hours. Uh, then you've got no expiration. These would be things that are very, very expensive to fetch. Like I'm going to fetch a thousand posts from the database and I'm going to crunch a bunch of numbers or do a bunch of filtering and then I want to save that result into the database forever until it gets asked uh, for again in a different way and then I'm going to make a different key for that slight uh, uh, alteration. So there's kind of a difference there. But this is baked into WordPress. Transient cache is part Part of WordPress, there's a WordPress API for this, and you can see we've got some uh, some functions here: so get transient, set transient, delete transient. So if you were to look at a common plugin, or if you were to look look at WordPress core, you would see um, these functions being used in WordPress. These are not. This is not an, a plugin or something you add to WordPress. So. Uh, the interesting thing about how WordPress uses this is it uses it for theme and plugin updates, like I said before. It uses them even to store file system directories. Um, don't know if you know this, but uh, sometimes it's expensive to go scanning directories on your disk every single request. So WordPress will actually go do that once, say, well, here's the theme directory, here's the plugin directory, here's what's in those directories, and it saves those what they call theme root directory to a transient cache. That way it's not asking your disk every single page load, where's the theme directory, where's the theme directory? Um, so that's an interesting tidbit. News feeds. So anytime you've got news maybe in your WordPress dashboard, you're pulling in feeds you know, about WordPress news, storing those in a transient cache because we don't need to fetch those all the time. And then complex MySQL queries. So this would be, man, let's look at an example. I've got an online store. I've got 15 different attributes for my product. And I have this super cool search feature on my website. And people can search all different sorts of filters. Uh, that probably translates into some crazy joins or a lot of meta querying inside the database. That, that basically just means expensive. If you don't know what that means, it just means expensive. It's not just saying, give me this value. It's saying, give me this value with all these conditions. And MySQL has to take a while to give that result. You can store that in a transient. So you can say, well, get me the transient value. If it's not there, OK, then go fetch it and then set a transient. That's essentially what the logic looks like. Um, but again, baked into WordPress, something that just kind of comes out of the box. Uh, if you're a plugin developer, this would be something you would use, but uh, this is more just informational so people understand that it's actually there. But now we're going to get into some of the good stuff. This is where we start actually talking about things that we can do as either engineers or as site owners or as uh, pros who have clients that we can actually do to make uh, our sites faster. One of them is object cache. Show of hands, who's heard of the term object cache before? Say, so a few of us. Um, this one, you know, can be very confusing. Um, I, I, rem I remember, you know, when I first came across some caching tech trying to understand, uh, you know, the different layers of caching. This one always confused me for some reason. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And we're going to talk about how this is partially in core WordPress already, but uh, how the, the implementation in, in core is kind of just a, it's kind of a, a halfway point. It's not, it's not taking it all the way there, and I'll explain what I mean. So object cache, again, it's a key value store. So we have this index of keys, and we say, OK, give me this key, and then there's going to be a value associated with that. And again, it can be done to store expensive queries to your database. Let's say on your home page, your database gets called 15 times. It has to go ask for posts. Uh, which user I'm going to show with some widgets on the sidebar. These are all calls that WordPress is making to the database to pull that content out. An object cache can be used to prevent uh, duplication. So if you're calling the same thing twice, actually WordPress by nature will just call it once, hold on to it for the life of the rest of the request. If it has to get called again, it goes, well, I've already got that. So I'm going to display it. I'm not going to make another call. Uh, and that's essentially what the root of object cache is, is it is storing 
content that you're querying from the database temporarily. Now, if you've ever heard of some of these technologies that are listed below here, we've got APCU, we've got Redis and Memcached. These are examples of key value storage technologies. You may go to some web hosts or you may have uh, some enterprise uh, clients uh, who are familiar with some of these things because these would be technologies, especially in the case of Redis and Memcached, would be uh, servers that you would put beside your website that would be sort of an intermediary between your website and uh, its database. And so these are uh, extracurricular uh, pieces of software, so to speak. You don't need these to run WordPress. This is strictly for creating object cache that is persistent. So, I said before that object cache is built into WordPress. So, uh, just a slight PHP lesson. When we start a request on a web page, that means that PHP is going to load from its earliest point all the way to the end. And PHP is just sequential in nature. It's just it's, it just starts at the top, ends at the bottom. Uh, if we've heard of hooks in WordPress, these are different points in the, in the life cycle of the request that certain things happen. And you can hook into those events and you can say, hey, when this happens, do this. But really, it starts at the beginning and it, and it has an end. Uh, and what WordPress will do is it will activate its ob internal object cache engine at the beginning. And when it's making queries, it can know, oh, this is a cacheable request, so if I get asked for that again, I can serve that in the life of the request. But as soon as someone else comes to the site and starts another request, it starts all over again. So in other words, that cache value does not persist across requests. It's just for the life of that request. So for the life of a request, you may save three or four calls to the database, but if you were able to persist that, you could save that three to four calls all the time, every time, without having to uh, have this um, uh, short life cycle cache. So that's where these three technologies that we we're talking about here make things persistent. So that means if I go to the home page as the very first user, I'm like user number one, and I go to the home page and I load up the page and it makes several calls to the database and then stores it in cache. Now I leave, someone else comes to the site, they get the cached copy. No call is ever made because it's being stored in one of these systems. So I'm going to talk briefly about APCU because that's uh, just my personal favorite because it's so easy. Um, it was introduced, I think, in PHP uh, 5. Uh, point, uh, 5 or 6. Um, and basically what it, what it does is it puts everything in, in a special uh, memory of PHP. So this is something that can just be installed. Everybody in this room can go talk to your host and say, hey, do you have APCU cache? And APCU cache is something that they can turn on. And when this is running, it means that the WordPress, uh, WordPress cache can be extended using an object cache plugin uh, to automatically just take advantage of that system. So the kind of the, the two steps of action are get your host to turn on APCU if it's not already, or get you on the product that has it, and then B, go find a APCU object cache plugin, which there are several out there on the WordPress repository for free, and activate it. And then suddenly, voila, your WordPress functions here for get cache, set cache, delete cache, will automatically, in core, be using the persistent cache. There's no configuration that you would have to do. Of course you can if you are into configuring stuff. You can go read about it and get into it, but uh, it really is that easy. Um, so, uh, that is object cache. Uh, huge performance benefit. Huge performance benefit. This is just a slight example here uh, where we've got uh, a, a WP cache get and we're basically getting uh, an update array. Cool. Uh, page cache. Who's heard of Varnish? Okay, a few of us. Um, this is interesting because it goes by a lot of names. And I always thought they were all different, but it turns out they're all the same thing. They just all get called something different. Um, so page cache is also sometimes called a proxy cache, sometimes called an HTTP cache, sometimes called a static cache. For whatever reason, people can't decide what to call it. Um, and it, it really is as simple as it serves dynamic content as just flat HTML. So if anybody, any of us are theme designers or we are 
uh, folks who create child themes or do any sort of uh, coding, you're already familiar with the fact that you create hooks, you create functions that call back into hooks, um, you understand that you can make changes to the code on the site, and it dynamically changes what is displayed on the website. Of course, that's the beauty of WordPress. That's why we all love it and use it. It means that we can go uh, you know, into a child theme and we can change things around. We can move our header. We can move the posts. We can move things around. And we know that when we go into the WordPress admin and we write a new post, it's going to dynamically change the homepage. I don't go in and edit HTML and put a new post in. That's the nature of the content management system. But that means that our pages are created dynamically. It means that PHP is really what is being parsed and outputting, spitting out HTML. So when I go to my browser and I open up the view source on a web page, it's all HTML. There's no PHP in there. It's because PHP is outputting all the HTML. But that comes at a cost. The cost is PHP having to go through all the hooks and PHP having to spit out all that HTML. That, that costs in terms of performance. So what does page cache do? Well, it just says that the first time you view it, we're going to get that flat HTML. Now I'm just going to store that HTML uh, somewhere in memory on disk. And the next time that same page gets asked, I'll just serve the HTML straight back out. I'm not going to do a PHP process and go call all the hooks. I'm just going to assume that you wanted the same thing as you wanted before, and I'm going to serve it back to you. This has substantial substantial performance uh, impact. This is the kind of cache you want, by the way, if you have very, very, very high traffic, high concurrent user uh, traffic to a website. So we're talking hundreds of people coming at the same time. They're logged out users. You know, they're not users who need a cookie or a shopping cart. They're users who are going there to read or they're going there to view information or fill out a form. Uh, Page cache is a huge, huge benefit uh, because you can serve many, 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 many more people uh, with static than you can with with uh, with dynamic. So some examples of that, as I said, Varnish is the most popular one probably. Um, but Apache Traffic Server, that I mean, those are my two favorites: Varnish and Apache Traffic Server. Um, Squid Proxy is kind of an old one. Some people who are really into Nginx, which is a type of server, there's a thing called a fast CGI module that allows you to kind of <coughs> flip a switch and turn on a proxy cache. Um, but this, this is also very, very dangerous. Uh, it also means that if changes are being made to your database, to your post, you, you put up a new post, guess what? That post isn't going to display on your website until you flush your page cache or tell it, hey, purge just the home page. Like, hey, I want you to just forget about the home page. You can keep the other pages, but I've just made a change, so therefore I need you to flush your cache. Uh, this is pr pretty critical. Um, you can get into a situation very quickly where you turn this sucker on and then you walk away and don't, don't really know what's going on. You've got stale content. Um, I was talking to a guy once who he turned on a page cache and months went by before he realized that all the posts he had been writing, no one could see because it was in a page cache. Um, that's why it's super, super important that we understand what some of these things are. So when we install our plugin, flip a switch, and it says page caching, static cache. Oh, okay, I know what that means. I want to make sure when I write my post that it's actually on the front of my website. While I'm logged out, by the way, because page caches will detect, oh, that you're logged into WordPress. I'll show you everything. I'll bypass the page cache. This is just for people who visit your site, aren't logged in, don't have any cookies, they're just there to view things. And a lot of times we don't check that. We don't open up uh, Chrome in incognito mode or Firefox, whatever mode it is, and I use Chrome, and uh, try to view our website like a logged out user. It's very, very important that we do. That's what you use IE? Wow, someone still uses IE. Good for you. <laughs> oh, to, to know... To know what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. Items, so. yeah. Man, that's now awesome. <laughs> Do what? Now they use for IE. Yeah, see? The, the use is testing for other people who are using IE. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so that's a little bit about page cache. Um, but I should kind of continue down this rabbit trail of, of why it's dangerous is that uh, I, I was talking to Pippin before this, uh, this, this talk, and he said, yeah, uh, uh, 
caching. Uh, if you only have one problem, add caching. Now you have two. Uh, you're, trying to, you're, you're trying to solve it with cache. Oh yeah, I'm getting lots of traffic. Um, but then inevitably, what, what, what are you doing? What is our definition? We're creating temporary copies of stuff, which means I essentially have impersonators of the real thing floating around serving content to users. And so when you make changes, do things, you could have Anytime someone comes to me at work and says, Frankie, we've got the weirdest thing going on, I'm like, it's probably cash. <laughs> it just, I mean, it probably is. Oh man, we do this thing and we click this thing and then like, oh my God, but we haven't touched that in months yet because it's probably in some cash somewhere. And that's always the answer. No, no, nine times out of ten is the answer. Um, so the, just things to keep in mind when we start installing these plugins, when we start uh, turning on caching, especially these advanced forms of cache, we have to double check and make sure that we're not uh, um, missing something obvious when it comes to problems. All right, a little bit of a technical one, but a lot of people already have this on by default. So actually, one of the exercises we could do after this probably is go check some of your websites that you're running and you'll, you could even find that this is already turned on. Uh, but if you find that it's not, go turn it on because it'll make things really fast. Um, it's called PHP OpCache, which is short for opcode, which is short for operational code. <laughs> um, I don't know why they call it that. Um, but yeah, basically, uh, you know, PHP is this language that gets interpreted. A lot of people say PHP gets compiled. If you're an engineer, we can debate it after this. But in my opinion, PHP does not get compiled. It gets interpreted. It gets interpreted by an engine, and that engine turns it into bytecode. This is getting super techy. Hang, hang in with me. And that bytecode uh, is ultimately what runs your code, runs your hooks, runs your plugins, runs your everything. Okay? And every time PHP has to go read those files from disk, right? Uh, it has to go interpret that language and turn it into bytecode, which turns into some sort of actual activity, some rendering, right? But what PHP opcode does is it gets all that in advance. Again, on the first call, it will take, oh, look, this is what WordPress core uh, bytecode looks like, and it will store it in memory. I don't know about you, but my core files in WordPress aren't changing that often. I update WordPress whenever an update comes out every few months, but for the most part, my WP admin and WP includes and my WP settings you know, files, uh, even my WP config, I don't change these files that are very often. They're core files. I might change my plugins and my themes uh, and my uploads directory, but my core files, no. So all that PHP, all that bytecode can be stored in memory so that every single request that comes in is getting an ultra-fast, pre-interpreted uh, uh, view of the PHP runtime and what needs to run. Um, so this is super, super fast. It literally is one line in your PHP INI file. If you don't know what that is, call your web host, ask for support, say, listen, tell me if my PHP INI file that runs my website has the opcode dot, opcache dot, and dot enable uh, set to one or set to on, O-N. You can do either one. Uh, and if it is, and your version of PHP is 5.5 or later, then you're already set, set, and you're good to go, and you're going to be fast. But if that is off or not there, that line, and you've got PHP 5.5 or later, uh, then you're going to notice a difference. You're going to notice a big difference. This That's is a, the speed of the site? This is the speed of every page load. Every single time, well, unless it gets hit by a page cache, which we just talked about. So if, if PHP has to get talked to, and PHP has to run, this will make it exponentially faster. Yes? Do what? Yes. It's the best. Good. Thank you for asking. Uh, this persists between requests. Why? Because it's in memory. So it's stored in memory, which unless your server restarts or you've got to purge it for some reason, uh, it will be stored in memory. Every request that comes in, uh, it'll persist. This is server side. Yep. Yep, and it's similar to how, I, I like to think of it similar to how APCU works, because APCU is also in memory, it's in the PHP's memory, so op cache is also PHP memory. Uh, little history lesson, so I said it's, it's preceded by APC. Let me explain the difference between APC and APCU. APC was called, 
uh, accelerated PHP cache, I think it's what it stands for. Um, and basically it did all sorts of things. It did this bytecode cache stuff. It uh, would do the object cache thing we talked about earlier. Uh, it did all sorts of different types of caching all kind of rolled into one. Well, around PHP 5.5, uh, Zen Group had created this you know, standalone op cache that was not a module of PHP, but it was actually built into PHP. And they decided, you know what? Let's get rid of, let's stop making APC a thing. Let's just build the best part of that APC, which is this, this bytecode cache into PHP itself. That way everyone just gets it, because it's like everyone should have it anyways, because it's amazing. PHP is slow without it, so let's just give it to everybody. Uh, but in the process, they kind of made APC obsolete. Well, then there was a group of people that said, wait a second. But opcode cache doesn't do object cache, which is the thing we talked about earlier. So let's create a fork or a new version of that called APCU, which stands for user cache. Um, so that's kind of where the split happened, and that's the difference, is that if you see APC, that represents kind of all-in-one 5.4 PHP and earlier. Uh, and the latest is there's op cache, which is built into PHP now, and all you got to do is flip this switch. And then you've got APCU, which is strictly for in-memory object cache. Um, uh, for database calls, yes. Does this already come with um, sites hosted by GoDaddy? Uh, yeah, most of our products. I mean, my products certainly, uh, just because we do the managed WordPress thing. Okay. So it's all about, it's kind of tailored for WordPress. But yeah, we have this enabled. We have APCU, Object Cache comes out pre installed, all that stuff. Are you sharing these slides? Sure. Yeah, I think I have to. I think they told me I had to. <laughs> uh, not that I want it, but. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going. I'm going fast. There's a lot to cover. So, uh, yeah. Do interrupt me with questions if you have them as we go. Cool. Any other questions on op code cache, op cache operational code? Question, yes. Um, about just the, if you're going to get to this, um, the strategy for requirements on what kind of caching to use. Yeah, right. What's going to guide right. You. So with page cache, like we said, this is for high traffic. Uh, this is for everybody. So if you are running WordPress and this is not on, you should go turn it on. Well, I was right? thinking in particular to the comment you made earlier about yep. Pippin saying caching is a second problem. So, yeah. So what, what rules do you use to make sure that that doesn't happen? So this is where you're going to want to make sure that whatever caching plugin you're using, if that's the route you've chosen to go, maybe that's W3 Total Cache, WP Rocket I hear people use a lot, um, WP Super Cache, you're going to want to understand how it flushes its cache. So you're going to want to talk to their support, read their information, understand when I make changes to my website, how does the cache flush? Is it periodically? So do I manually have to do it? Correct, because uh, you know the way to defeat the cache is to flush it out the window. And and but if you don't understand when your various layers of cache get flushed, uh, and sometimes you also find that things get flushed when they don't have to be flushed. I mean, let's just think about this: if you update a post on your website, you go to WordPress, post, add new, and you're typing something and you hit publish, this does not need to be flushed. This these are f PHP files on your disk that it's caching, right? So content in the database, it has nothing to do with this. So you might find, well, may maybe my, this cache plugin is flushing opcode cache every time you update a post. Well, that's actually making your site less efficient uh, because you didn't need to touch the files. You're writing a post, which saves it into the database, which has nothing to do with changing files. But if you update a plugin, <laughs> <laughs> if this doesn't flush, you're going to be like, why is the plugin doing what it did before and it acts like it's not updated? Because that, because something didn't flush the opcode cache. Um, so it's, yeah, really important. Yep. There's darn widgets. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's probably going to be page cache more than anything. Uh, a page cache, some sort of static cache. The thing that I actually regret not putting on this slide at all, at all is browser cache because I think everybody in this room has probably been in that situation where you're like, hold down shift and control and hit R and then the, it'll be fine. And like you're telling a client that or whatever. Um, or open incognito. It's because the browser holds on to so much, uh, so many assets and tries to cache even pages. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, page cache is probably the number one with that. 
there might be some object cache implications because widgets are stored in the database. So they're stored in the options table in WordPress. If you have an object cache that's 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 you know caching that information, uh, you and you're just going to the widget screen and dragging some stuff. Well, you should probably make sure to flush your cache um, because it's possible that they're they're in there. Yes. Right, so so that's why when you are logged in, all page cache should be disabled. Any plugin that says they enable page cache, any system that if you were to go have it built for you or build it yourself that uses page caching, again, static, it's taking static HTML and just serving that, it should totally be off if you're logged in. You should never, if you're using a shopping cart, which creates a cookie when you add something to your cart, any cookie that creates a session for the customer uh, f should bypass page cache. So, object cache too. Object cache too. Uh, for logged in users, uh, the only type of cache that I think is acceptable is, is uh, this one and transient. Um, object cache and, and page cache are probably your two most dangerous ones. Those are the ones that. Um, are going to give you those elusive, weird problems. And, and you made a great point, which is especially if you have user-generated content in like a members area or something like that, I mean, absolutely not are you going to want page caching. I remember, okay, this is like terrible story. I got to tell it. So I, uh, this is like 2009 or something. I'm at this website. I have to, I'm about to leave the country. I'm going to like England or something. I'm like totally freaking out because I don't have my passport. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go to one of these passport expediting websites. And at the time it was kind of like new, like you can get your passport in two weeks. So I go to the site, I fill out all my information. The site was built on Drupal and <laughs> I could tell. I looked at the source and, and I'm like filling in my information. And then suddenly I go to this login screen and a login's filled out for me. And the login was called admin. I was like, this is weird. I ah, click login. I became the freaking admin of the site. Because their caching was persistent and was not ignoring cookie users. So that's an example of like OMG, fire drill. I, I emailed the president of the company and told him, and of course he was very thankful that I let him know that your site is extremely compromised. <laughs> I could see everyone's information of every customer who has ever given you all their personal info for passports. I saw it all. I was like, I can't unsee this. I have to like get out of here. <laughs> I told him exactly what I did to reproduce. I showed him screenshots. I said, listen, this is very, very bad, but you can trust me. I'm a good guy. Um, <laughs> or I wouldn't be telling you, right? Um, but, but yeah, so yeah, super dangerous, right? So we have to understand what we're doing. Don't just turn on a caching plugin and walk away. Very, very important. Any other questions about before we move on? Yes? I had another sort of object cache question. Okay. Um, a lot of times I'll be goofing over like a custom post type or something and I'll be displaying like that. Mm -hmm. We're going to go off script. <laughs> like I had one. Okay. A, B, C. I think this is here. Hey, yeah. All right. So, this is a. So, you can actually go Google this. It's like Google, like, APCU script or uh, APCU a dashboard. Google that. You'll find some GitHub repo and they'll have some one single file and it's this apc.php, uh, apcu.php and basically it's this giant file, you just drop it in your site and then it'll expose a page where you can go see your object cache. Every single entry, you can password protect it. I did not on this because it's just a test site that I use. Um, but yeah, it shows you where the fragments are. It gets real technical about uh, how the cache is being used. So this tells me how much I have free and how much I've used. I can go to user cache entries. I can see each individual. So here I've got 
uh, options, post, I've got tags, post meta, which you just mentioned. So this would be really helpful for you, I feel like, to go actually see your object cache, visualize it, and to go into something like this. This is the, just to kind of give background, this is the key, right? We talked about key value store. This is the key, and I click it, and there's the value. So that's the value that's being stored. Normally, WordPress would have to do a post meta query to the database, which would pull out a serialized array, probably, which gets translated into that. But instead, APCU stores that key value pair in memory so that we're not making that request every time. So every time we need to call WP post meta for post ID 1, we're automatically going to be able to pull that from memory. So this is probably a helpful tool to, to check out. Uh, let me also show you another one called OpCache. This is a OpCache dashboard, so go Google that. And uh, this is the same kind of idea except for OpCache. So it'll tell you, you know, which of your um, which of your files are uh, the bytecode has been pre-interpreted uh, and has been saved in memory. If I go to also, by the way, you can reset the cache from here. It'll let you flush it on your own. Same thing with the APCU, you can flush it manually, so that's kind of cool, it gives you some control. So you don't have to do everything on code or in the command line. Um, so yeah, 492 files have been cached. Looks like they're all WordPress core files. WP includes, WP settings, which is great because I don't touch those files. They never get changed. I only update WordPress whenever it comes out, once a quarter, whatever. So great, that means that 492 of my files don't have to be read from disk by PHP on every page load. You can start to imagine how fast this makes your site, right? Quick question about the, yes. The, how far does WordPress go in loading admin stuff and when you're not an admin, for example? And is that what you're talking about? Here? This is nothing to do with WordPress. This is strictly a PHP file that I dropped into my site. Oh, right. Uh, so the op cache is going to cache all files. Unless I give it a blacklist and say, hey, don't cache these certain files, it's going to just cache every PHP file that ever gets called in PHP runtime. So if I go back to overview and I go down, there it is. There is a file called something.blacklist. And that's my blacklist file name. So if I go to this blacklist and on every new line I put a, a you know a path to a file, OpCache will always ignore it. So if you want to always ignore your WP config because maybe you change it a lot, you could go in and say always ignore this, or I want to always ignore this certain plugin. Um, you could go put that in your blacklist. You know we're starting to get a little advanced, but that that would be how you do it. Cool. Yes. That is the most yeah. truthful analogy. It's so true. I mean, yeah, uh, in memory, uh, we've heard of SSD drives. They're the only exception. Uh, SSD is essentially using m memory storage as your disk. Um, but there's a reason why SSD is so much faster than spinning disk, and that's the same difference. So in memory is extremely, extremely fast. Um, it's made to be a random access memory. It's meant to be read frequently and overwritten frequently and, and disk is so slow, so slow. And it's, it's dangerous. If you're reading from disk a lot, you have a high traffic site, we're not just talking about your site's loading slower, we're talking about your server crashing. So, you know, if you get really popular or a client gets really popular one day and your site's just, I'm gonna read from disk on every single request, hundreds of files. Uh, eventually there's gonna be a choke point. It may not even be that you don't load that fast, it's just that your server's like, I can't handle that much IO, so I will now crash. Yes? Yes, by default it does. Which is why, I'm, man, man, I'm so glad you asked that. Which is why you don't have to necessarily go flushing this every time you update a plugin 
are doing that because opcode cache by default will look at timestamps on the files. So it has a separate registry where it lists out all the timestamps and it knows the last modified time of every single file. So when the files get called, it checks its, its internal uh, ledger, oh, that that's the same version that I already have, so I'm not going to do anything about it. And you can even set a time limit. I think by default it only checks every two seconds. So in other words, if you get pummeled with traffic, it's not hitting your file system a ton. Just every two seconds it might go check to see, make sure. But you can turn that off. And if you turn that off, then you're not checking the file system at all. Like you're not even making any file system calls. So if you're going to, if you know, I'm about to get, I'm about to get 100,000 people coming to my website, you're probably going to want to turn that off because you're going to want, not want disk read at all, but you're going to want to remember to turn it back on or remember to flush your own opcache every time you update a plugin, which you're probably going to forget. Um, but very good question. That, the, the config for that is somewhere. It's there though. Yes? You had mentioned that you only go through and and deal with this basically quarterly or whenever you do that. And I was thinking it's kind yeah. of important to have it turned on except when you know you don't need it just because WordPress does do some updates without us now. Yes, so. it does. Yeah, which is why, yeah, I mean like uh, the default settings of OpCache where it, uh, there it is. Revalidate, re revalidate frequency. Every two seconds it will check for revalidation and uh, yeah, it, it, by default, it kind of self-manages that way, so we don't have to worry about it. We, again, just have to make sure we go turn on that one line, op cache enable equals one, and it will make everything fast, which is great. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. We're going to get into a little bit more familiar territory now. CDNs. Who's heard of a CDN before? Okay, lots more people. Cool. CDN stands for Content Delivery Network. It's super cool because the whole premise of the idea is that we get closer to the actual user who's requesting uh, the page. That's the whole premise of CDN. It's not that the CDN servers are faster than your server, which they probably are, but it's not about that. It's about that they're distributed all across the world and that they are closer to the user. So just, you know, goes without saying that if I want to talk to someone, it's easier for me to talk to someone who's right next to me than someone who's further away. That's the same thing with CDN. Basically, they call it edge network or edge caching, and it means that they're getting closer to the edge of the customer. So if someone in Brazil is calling your site that's hosted in Dallas, but you have a CDN enabled, that means that some of your assets, like JavaScript and CSS and images, may end up on a server that's in uh, Mexico. Mexico City, which is going to be closer, or it's going to be in Portugal, which is going to be closer. So th those are the kinds of things that, uh, that are basically a CDN will allow you to do. Um, the other thing that's cool about CDN is that it replicates itself, so it's like zero management. You just turn it on, and then it just works. Uh, it just replicates itself, and if someone from Asia calls it, for the first time, it goes, well, I don't have that copy yet, but I'll go call the copy from elsewhere, then I'll transfer that over to the ocean and store it locally in Asia. So now anybody else who calls in Asia will have the local Asia copy. This is really important for things like images, because images are huge. Um, that's why Jetpack Photon, Jetpack, when they came out with the free CDN, that just if you install Jetpack and activate it, you get CDN. Uh, some people don't even know it exists, but if you ever notice your image URLs and your web page source change to be like WP dot whatever, um, that's because they, they're they using their CDN for your images. It makes things load really, really, really fast. But some other popular ones are Cloudflare, which is free. You can turn that on and it will not only CDN your images, but also uh, your JavaScript and your CSS assets. And then AWS has one, Sakuri has one, Akamai has one. Uh, they're all very popular. So I'd encourage everyone to go check out Cloudflare or Jetpack uh, if you want just images and uh, turn those on because those will really help uh, your, your speed a lot. The other thing that's interesting though about images is that they don't change that often. I don't know, can anyone remember the last time they uploaded an image in WordPress and then like edited it or deleted it but needed another image up with the exact same name? It doesn't happen that often. It happens, but it's not that frequent. Um, JavaScript and CSS, on the other hand, they do change a lot with every plugin update. So it's important that you understand when your CDN is being flushed. When you say, hey, 
you know, flush these assets because I just made some changes to the website, you're going to want to make sure that you understand how your flushing works on a CDN. Cloudflare, I, I know you can go in and manually just say flush my cache. They even have this cool thing called developer mode, development mode. You could say I'm in development mode and then for three hours it will just turn off all of their caching and all of their CDN so it'll allow you to work on the site and then automatically after three hours you don't even have to remember, it just turns back on, which is pretty cool. Cloudflare and it is free. Minification, who's heard of minification? Okay. Simply put, it removes white space characters from your scripts, from your JavaScript, CSS, or HTML. However, some minification tools can modify the code. They don't actually rewrite the code. It doesn't just remove white space. Here's an example. Before, I have a function uh, called sum, and I've got two arguments, number one and number two. And then I'm going to return the sum of num1 plus num2. But then I run through a minification program and it turns it into function sum AB return AB because I don't need to have the letters NUM because I don't care if it's human readable. I just want to make it the most efficient few characters as possible. And so that is what uh, some minification tools will do. They will actually rewrite the code to make it less redundant and they will use shorthand that makes it the human readable out the window because who cares? It's just it's just a long string of code that only the machine can learn, that can read. That's huge because it makes the payload of your assets, your JavaScript, your CSS that's being called in the browser, makes it much smaller. Sometimes you can cut down your assets by 50%, which makes, of course, them load twice as fast, which is really, really cool. Concatenation. There's not, I didn't put a lot on this slide, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, chain the contents of, of JavaScript and CSS together. So basically what this means is I'm, if I'm calling a JavaScript file uh, jQuery and then I'm calling a jQuery plugin and then I'm calling some other thing, instead of that being three JavaScript files and three HTTP requests by the browser, I just take all the contents and string them together into one file and make one request to one job. JavaScript file, and then I just reduced my PHP, uh, HTTP request by 30%. That's the general idea. Yes? Um, I've heard that with uh, the HTTP2, multiple files uh, would actually be faster than having a single file. I don't know if that's true, but what you're talking about is waterfall. You want to know waterfall views because uh, lots of tools give you this. Chrome Inspector gives it to you. GT Metrics is a great tool. Um, that will show you a waterfall view of your site. So it'll basically say, here's all the assets. Here's the 27 HTTP requests that are being made. There's a total size. There's a total uh, time it took. And it tells you each, what each one of these is, what kind of asset it is. And then it tells you this is the load time. So what you're referring to, HTTP2, means that we can have more things happening asynchronously and the time is much faster. I don't know if that statement is necessarily true that it's faster to not concatenate. I haven't heard that. Um, it wouldn't surprise me that in some scenarios it could be true, but I don't think that would be true in every scenario. That's my gut. Um, yes? If we were to turn on the opcache, would we see this waterfall? Or is these cache versions? Or are these so this has nothing to do with opcache. This, but these are assets. But the caching of files, when we cache files. Would not cache these. These are not PHP files. These are JavaScript, CSS, images, but fonts. Okay. So you would, in a situation where you would cache those, if you're expecting a thousand people and mm -hmm. you're going to change your static page, you just sign it. Yep. Would you see these or would you see one file? You would see all of these. So if you look at your source of your web page, so go open a web page, open up source, anything that's like an image source with a URL or uh, calling CSS or calling JavaScript, each one of those is a request that the browser has to make to the server. And each one of those has to be an individual request. So some of the caching that we've learned about reduces the amount of calls. So we'll see an impact on this. Potentially. Uh, the one that's going to make the most difference, though, is page cache. So the object cache is not going to make a difference. The opcode cache, not going to make a difference with this waterfall view. What would make a difference is page cache, because it means that we're going to be able to store, uh, like this top one here says frankiejarrett.co. That's my HTML content. So that's normally a dynamic page load. If I had 
an, a static cache, it would be instant uh, HTML. So, but all these would be benefit, benefited by a CDN and minification and concatenation, the last uh, three that we talked about. All right. So we're done. We're out of video time. Um, so thank you very much for listening, and I appreciate it. And we'll, I'll stick around for more questions uh, afterwards, but thanks.